Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when Dr. Hager called and asked me if, if I could come down and speak about coyotes tonight, I said, sure, because any information the TWRA has that could assist anybody regarding wild animals, uh, we're more than happy to do that. Although, although, uh, I've given 100, maybe 150 coyote seminars in my career. I've been to every county in western Tennessee. I've been to every state in the southeastern part of the United States. And Tennessee has probably done more research on coyotes than any state, certainly in the eastern part of the United States. Our program in the state of Tennessee is nationally known for our success. The reason that we're successful in the state of Tennessee is that we learned as much as we could about the animal and we learned as much as we could about mistakes that other states have made in trying to deal with this critter. There is absolutely no way that I would look forward to coming and talking about coyote problems in an urban environment. It is the most difficult problem to deal with. Doesn't mean we don't have a solution, because we do have a solution. But the solution is more philosophical than it is on the ground, get your boots muddy. And if you will bear with me just a little bit, I might also say I've never done a 20 or 30 minute coyote seminar in my life, so I'm gonna be speaking really fast tonight. Uh, if, if I talk too fast, somebody throws something at me and I'll stop. In order for us to understand what we have to do to solve the problem of coyotes in this area of Nashville, we have to understand a little bit about the history of coyotes. Truly the most amazing animal that I've ever dealt with in my career. Uh, I don't know of any individual personally who's killed more coyotes than I have. Uh, but I don't hate them because they've taught me a lot. If you look up coyote in the dictionary, or at least the dictionary that I looked it up once upon a time, it had three definitions. One was a small wolf-like animal of Western North America. Well, they need to change that because it's in Eastern America now. The second definition was a despicable person or a cheat. The third definition was, according to American Indian folklore, a cultural hero. If we can understand the differences be between the way modern man looks at the coyote and has the definition of a contemptible person or a cheat, and the American Indian who looked at it as a cultural hero, we might be able to understand what the best thing to do is in this part of Nashville to solve our, solve our coyote problems. Certainly, people before us have not tried to learn that. I guess what I ought to start with is how do you pronounce it? Uh, in the West, where I did a lot of the training on coyote controls, they call them coyotes. In the eastern part of the United States, they call them coyotes. So both is correct. Where I come from, in the really country part of western Tennessee, they call them coyotes, C-O-W-O-A-T-S, <laughs> and a lot of other things that, that I can't repeat in this wonderful church. We, we cannot get at the root of this problem until we understand what makes coyotes different than other types of animals. Uh, and the sheer fact that they're here is going to shed a little light on this. If I go there, I have to carry the mic with me, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what I was going to draw. And I'm a terrible artist, so this is probably a good thing for y'all. Coyotes were first documented in the southwestern part of the United States, and they moved north across the western part of the United States and then east. And you know, we have this big river running up through the middle of the country called Mississippi River, and up in the northern part of the country, you can throw a rock across it on a good day. And the coyotes just swam right across the Mississippi River, came in through the northern part of the United States, and down south. And once they came down south, they started converging on the states of Kentucky and Tennessee. They went across into New England. And one of the things about uh, uh, any animal is that the farther north they go, the bigger the body size is farther south they go, the smaller the body size. This is a good thing for us because the average size, thank you, doctor. What are we talking about when we talk about coyotes in this part of the country? Well, we're talking about this beautiful animal right here who, if you notice, I mounted in a non-aggressive way. Uh, I told him to stay before he came in here. He will not move up. Uh, this, this shows the typical coloration of a coyote, probably some of the coyotes that y'all are seeing in your area. A typical coyote 
is about 20 to 25 pounds for the females, and the males go 30 to 40 pounds. A really big coyote is 40 pounds or over. I've killed the two largest coyotes documented. We can put him down now. He'll still stay. <laughs> I've killed the two largest coyotes that have been documented in the state of Tennessee, and, and, and they weigh 45 pounds and 47 pounds. Both those coyotes were about the same length as this animal. They were just really fat, really big, okay? But we're looking at a very small, relatively small animal. But that doesn't mean that he can't do damage. Coyotes are excellent killers. They know exactly what they're doing when they try to kill something. But they did come across the Mississippi River at Memphis. Some say that they walked across the bridge. I'm not really sure how they did that, but I'm, we have photos of them actually crossing the bridge, so we know they did do that to some degree. They came into Tennessee in the late 70s, and we started seeing them showing up more and more, and there were remnant populations that showed up in other places, but between 1978 and 1988, in the state of Tennessee, coyotes occupied every county in the state in 10 years, 10 years. All my friends at the Wildlife Agency, if we had wanted to stock a species of animals and do that, we couldn't have done that. So they went across the state in 10 years and we had documented stock loss in about 75% of those counties. So we immediately started doing public relations work and we'd go to every county and we'd do cow seminars and try to explain what things hadn't worked in the past. And before I get into those, so you understand why they didn't work, we have to talk briefly about coyote breeding biology, because it's the key to understand why we won't win this war unless we're smart. Did the mic go? Okay. Coyotes are what we call density-dependent breeders. That means that through some miraculous plan, coyotes can feel pressure from other coyotes within their home ranges. And if they feel too much pressure, the size of their litters go down. If they don't feel pressure, the size of their litters go up. The less, the fewer the coyotes, the more in their litters, the more coyotes, the fewer the litters. In the state, in the United States, the average litter size is 6.2 pups per litter. In the state of Tennessee, our average litter size is 5.8. Here's your math test. Do we have more or less coyotes in the state of Tennessee than the average across the state? More. more. Y'all are great. Y'all are doing good. We get that figure by several different methods. One is called by counting placental scars. So if we kill a female, we open her up, and we can actually tell how many pups were born in the last year, if you get in there quick enough and look at it. Right now, in western Tennessee, the average litter size is about 8.1. What's happening with the cow population in western Tennessee? It's going down. We did nothing to make it go down. Nothing. It's called a natural population oscillation, and they go up and they go down and they go up and they go down, and there's nothing we have to do with that. In the western part of the United States, back in the 60s, the federal government decided that we needed to get rid of coyotes. And this was strictly political, because they were eating a lot of sheep and a lot of calves and causing all sorts of damage to agriculture out there. So they appropriated millions and millions of dollars. And they said, let's eliminate the coyotes in the western part of the United States. And they did. I'm going to give you a brief rundown of everything they did. They used poisons. They used a poison called 1080, which is not legal now. They used strychnine. They incorporated a, a controlled measure practice called denning, where you find where the mama coyote is raising her pups, go in, dig the pups out, hit them in the head with a sledgehammer, or with a hammer, and kill them. That's denning. They did that. They did aerial hunting. They aerial hunted with shotguns out of helicopters to kill every cow that they could see. They used traps, which if we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about here, leg hole traps, which are not the uh, terrible things you've heard about. And they used snares. 
These are the two primary things that Western Tennessee and a lot of Middle Tennessee landowners used to control their property. And they shot, calling coyotes and bringing them in. At the end of a five year period, there were more coyotes than when they started. <laughs> now, can y'all tell me why? The more they killed them, the more babies they had. The highest litter size on record is 17 pups per litter. Sometimes they have only one or two. All these things that I'm telling you about apply to country coyotes. Country coyotes. We know a lot about coyotes that live in the country. We've looked at over 700 coyote stomachs. That's not a nice job. <laughs> because you have to go through all that stuff and you have to filter it out. Then you have to identify all these little critters and bones and stuff that are in there. And we've looked at over 20,000 coyote scats. Know what scats are? <laughs> My wife almost left me one day when I had a bunch of them out on the kitchen table going through. <laughs> But you can find out a lot about that, about what they eat. And what we found out is they eat everything. If it's there, they're going to eat it. They eat primarily small mammals, mice, rats, those things you wouldn't mind to eat. They eat cocktail rabbits. Certain times of the year, they eat persimmons like crazy. You got persimmon trees in your yard? It's the greatest attractive for a coyote there can be. They eat wild cherries. <laughs> They eat anything that has fruit on it, and they love it. They follow calves around, and they eat calf droppings, because calf droppings are very rich, rich in nutrients. And for a long time, we thought they were following the cows around to eat the calves, but they weren't. They were eating the calf after birth, because it's very high in protein. They eat cow manure and love it. They like it. They eat anything. We saw them. A red man chewing tobacco pouch in one of the stomachs. Six young red foxes in one stomach. They eat anything. What are they eating on half to half? <laughs> Cats. Dogs, maybe. We're going to get into that in just a minute. Doc, you tell me now when I'm really messing up and going over the greatest, most significant computer model that's ever been done on any species of wildlife has been done on the American coyote. And all these biologists from across this country put all this data in, uh, death rates, uh, birth rates, disease, uh, man's activities, and what that computer came up with because of density-dependent breeding was that if you could kill three out of every four coyotes walking around on the ground right now, it would take greater than 50 years to eliminate the species. The best we ever did, spending millions and millions of dollars, throwing everything at him with the exception of the atomic bomb, was one out of four. Now knowing that, what are we going to do about the coyotes in downtown Nashville? Well, hopefully we're not going to do what Los Angeles did or some of the other places that have gotten in really big trouble. And that is, they think it's really cool to have coyotes running around in their neighborhood. And some people think it's really cool to see the coyotes eating their dog food in the backyard because it's communal. You know, it makes us one with nature. <laughs> when I go call coyotes that, are having, that have caused problems to landowners, the, the sound that I use is of, of a young rabbit in distress. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like a baby crying. Just like that. So when a lady left her infant in the backyard in Los Angeles, who had been watching coyotes feed in her backyard and thought it was communing with nature, and the coyote came in and stole her baby, and she was really upset about her lifestyle with coyotes. We don't want that to happen in Nashville. And we don't want it to happen in Memphis. And right now we're doing everything possible to keep that from happening. And I don't want to scare you. 
There's not one documented attack on humans of cows in the state of Tennessee. And God willing, there won't ever be. And I know there won't be after tonight if y'all just listen to what I'm saying. Because a cow is here in this part of Nashville for a couple of reasons. Number one, it thinks it can survive here. And the reason it thinks it can survive here is it only thinks about a couple of things. Food, breeding, and taking care of pups. That's all it cares about. Food, breeding, and taking care of pups. If it didn't have food here, it would be somewhere else. If it thought it was going to get killed, it would be somewhere else. The amazing irony of this whole thing is that I can go to the country and talk to farmers where we get, when we back up, 15 to 20 years ago, 98% of our complaints were from country folks talking about cows eating their calves. We taught country folks how to take care of the problem. And the problem is not reducing the population because the population can never be reduced by us. The problem is some cows get into trouble. You kill those cows. You take the problem cows out because the vast majority of the rest of the cows are not a problem in the country. In the city, most of them are problems. Why are they a problem? Besides eating your cats, what else? Anybody tell me? What are some more problems? Disease. Not so much disease. It's a safety concern. It's, they're frightening. <laughs> You're scared. What are you scared of? They're going to attack us. They're going to attack you. And you have every right to have that fear because you don't understand. They don't want to attack you. And the only way they would attack you is if you force them to attack you. And you force them to attack you by thinking that you need to live with them so that they are never afraid of you. I went to one of these meetings in Nashville a couple of years ago, and this man told me that, uh, that one had come on his back porch, and he refused to leave. And I'm thinking, mm. because I've just been to a meeting where this 64-year-old woman in a little town called Gibson in West Tennessee had told me that a cow came on her back porch and she said, you know, I yelled at it and it didn't want to leave. She beat it to death with a broom hand. <laughs> her attitude was, no cow is going to tell me that it's going to stay on my back porch when I don't want it to. The mental fact here is that they will shy away from us. They want to be afraid of us because that's natural. But when they come into the city of Los Angeles and people feed them, and all these things go where, where they seem to be one in one, suddenly they want more. And they will take everything they can up until the point that you tell them it's no longer cool for you being here. And that's what you have to do. You cannot reduce the population. You can't deal with anything except cows that are causing a significant health threat, and that will be an individual cow. That is the only time that we should ever get involved with removing a cow. If it demonstrated the Los Angeles scenario, and we could prove that it was no longer afraid of humans, and it was being very aggressive toward humans. <laughs> what can you do to make cows know it's not welcome in this area? You might tell me. Don't leave the dog food up. Keep your dog food up. If you leave dog food up or cat food up, they're going to find it. What else can you do? Keep your small pets inside. I'm sorry? Keep the animals inside. You don't have to keep your animals inside. It's your yard. Take your animals out if you want to. What happens if you see a cow when you let your animals out? The main thing you have to do is tell all your neighbors. Get in a mindset that when you see a cow in your neighborhood, you do something to make it aware it's not welcome. You yell at it. You throw a rock at it. Don't swerve and try to hit it with a car. We had somebody wreck last week. Didn't they? Don't do that. What can you do? Somebody think of a great idea that would be loud like a gun. Starter pistol works great. What else? Firecrackers. Too. You blow up in your hand. To get to what else? Blow up a balloon. Blow up a balloon. Have balloons. 
next to your door. If you see if you see cows in your yard, blow it up real fast. Don't have a heart attack. Blow it up real fast and pop it. It sounds real a lot like a gun. When a cow hears that, he says, "I'm not welcome here, and I might get killed." He will go somewhere else. You have to make the cow. You have to depend on cow biology. They will not go where they think they're going to get hurt. They will go to places where they think no one's going to hurt them. So they're not aggressive. They are not aggressive unless they're in the city and y'all have trained them that they can't fear you. How so if you throw... I'm sorry? Rabies. How much rabies? There's not one single case of positive case of rabies in cows in the state of Tennessee. That is not to say that they don't carry rabies. The state of Texas has a bad problem with rabies in cows, but not in Tennessee. Is that right? That is correct. If you throw a rock at it, it's not going to come attack you? If you throw a rock at it and it starts toward you, you pick up a bigger rock. It's your yard, okay? That's Now, that's the mindset you've got to do. No, I will almost guarantee you that if you throw a rock at that cow and get remotely close to it, it's going to run away and it's going to remember that lady threw a rock at me. Yes. How agile are they in terms of, like, five-foot fences? Miraculous. They can, they can clear that, like, easily. Miraculous. They can go under anything. They can go over most things. I've got a couple more things I'm going to tell you, but... What if, um, I walk my dogs sometimes, and I know they've been out. Would they ever try to, or would they ever try to attack a dog but not me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. And, and let me explain, let me explain why. There's a couple of, a couple of periods of the time of year when, when you need to worry about that. During the pup rearing, good grief, we haven't even got into half of this. During the pup rearing season, Anybody tell me what the average home range of a cow is? Just stay tuned. Take a, take a guess. Somebody take a guess. Five miles. Twenty miles. All right. We're getting there. This is real important. If I can get the pen. Average home range in the state of Tennessee is 16 square miles. 16 square miles. During pup rearing, when they have the pups, it goes down to about four square miles. In dispersal season, which is in the fall of the year when mom gets tired of her teenagers hanging around and she kicks them out, we've got radio tracking gone and they've gone 75 miles before. If mom says leave, they leave. And they keep going until they find a place where they don't feel that density around them. You got about 15 minutes. Do we? Oh, great. Okay. First cow that ever came into Davidson County. This is really good. This is Davidson County. Terrible artist. First cow that came into Davidson County, let's say it came up around Northwest Park in here, and let's say it was a female. Okay? Because we were really concerned about this at the beginning. We were concerned about a thing called coy dogs. Y'all ever heard of that? Half cow, half dog. So that female comes in and she's looking for those home range circles. She's smelling around. She can't find any more coyotes. And she sees this really good looking collie, male collie. And she looks at him and she says, no, no, he's not good enough. He's not my type. He's going, I'm going on. And she goes out and she does a 16 mile circle. And in that 16 mile circle, she has not found one other scent of a coyote because she's the first one there, but she doesn't know it. And she's in season. And she's running out of season this time of year, right now. And she comes back around and she sees that collie again. He's a lot better looking now <laughs> than he was seven days ago. <laughs> and they consummate that relationship. And she goes out and has her litter. And now they're half collie and half coyote. And they look <laughs> half coyote, half collie but they have all of mama's traits and they remember genetically not fearing man. So we were really, really scared about this until we find out that only about 3% of Tennessee's wild canines are koi dogs. We have 97% are the real deal. In urban areas, it's more prevalent to have koi dogs than outside. And we've had lots of different koi dog crosses. We've had coyote coon hound crosses. We've had coyote rottweiler crosses. That was a mean dog. We've had coyote poodle crosses. Ugly and terribly misguided. 
But that's probably not what you're dealing with. What you're dealing with are the pure cows. And so what I'm going to do is, is end this and answer any more questions that you may have by telling you that if you want help in controlling a problem coyote in your area, call us and we'll teach you how to do that on your own property. If you don't want to do that, you have a couple of things that you can do. You can fence your property. There are fences that are coyote proof. Most of them are electric. Uh, do, please do this neighborhood thing of any time you see a coyote, have the leader, you're the leader, have the leader document, have, call her and tell her where on the street you saw the coyote, where you can start a little map, where you know where the sightings are gonna be, because that's gonna really help us out later if, if we have to come back in and help you. So if you get dots on this map in your area where the coyotes are being seen, that's gonna tell you all where the habitat is that it likes the most, okay? After you start this little map and then you start your aversive conditioning, which means every time you see one, it's an unwelcome guest and make it aware of that. If you still want something else, I, I, I got on Google uh, the other day, I didn't know you could do that, and, and drove down Hampton Hampton. Gosh, you got some beautiful houses down there. It's really pretty. Big yards. I know what kind of like it. <laughs> you are big enough, yards are big enough, that you can do this and it will immediately stop your problem. Y'all know what a Great Pyrenees is? You ever heard of a Great Pyrenees? In every case that I know of in West Tennessee where someone has bought a Great Pyrenees dog and raised it on their house, coyote problems go to zero. It's a big dog and it eats a lot of food, but it's not aggressive. They're not mean dogs at all. They're just big and a coyote smart enough to say, I am not going in the yard with that big thing there. And that's the simple truth of the matter. And did you have a question? Is vegetable compost a problem in Question was, is vegetable compost a problem? And yes, ma'am, it's a very big problem. In West Tennessee, one of the biggest problems we have is in watermelon patches. Cows will decimate a watermelon patch and only eat the ripe ones. That's the truth. Only eat the ripe ones. Do they feed more than day or the night? Do they feed all the time? They feed mostly at night mostly around sunrise and sunset. And, but in the city, where they're not afraid of anything, they probably feed any time they want to. Will they come in a dog door? Is the dog door in a house? In, in a basement? If you get one coming in your house, you've got a problem, Kyle, that we need to know about. <laughs> they should not do that. No. <laughs> Are they likely to, as far as a lair or a, where they're hanging here, are they just as likely to, to find in a, I mean, I'm asking if there's like an old abandoned, probably a chicken keep or something over on, uh, yes, off of golf club. Uh, if it's got soft it's dirt in it, that there were in there or something, they, they can dig a den there. Yeah. Like, there's houses all around it. I mean, they're, if they're not afraid of the people in the houses around it, They'll dig a den close to your house. So what do you do if you find a den, an, you know, an actually active den? Is there anything to do? You can't scare away the pups and you can't, you know, you can make it uncomfortable, but what, you've got an active den. You've got, you know, pups being reared. If you have an active den that you've identified, mm -hmm. you need to call the folks at the Region 2 office and ask them what to do and they'll assist you. How do you know a den when you see it? I mean, if they, if they dug in or they under trees? Every one of them are going to be just like this. They're going to be about that big around. If you see a hole in the ground that's that big around, that's got bare dirt out in front of it, and you can tell tracks are going in and out, and there's bits of poodles laying in front of it. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. The remains of the animals they've been feeding on will be out in front of it. That's the size of the culverts that go underneath every one of our driveways in the front ditch, and that's what the den is that I saw over on Knollwood. Uh, last fall, so uh, with with last spring, with you know three pups playing in the in the street at dusk, and so you know that's exactly the size. And you know we reported it, and I couldn't get any real advice other other than it's part of urban society. And you've got to deal with it. It is the landowner's responsibility wherever that den was, and if you don't have the landowner's responsibility uh, permission to do something about it, there is nothing you can do legally. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
story, but back to the dog walking thing. Yeah. If you are walking your dog and you see one, do you take off running the other way? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. You hold your ground. You hold your ground. And one thing you can do is buy, when you're walking your dog, I would, I would really advise you all to get the pepper spray. You know, if you can't get the pepper spray for, your, for home protection, uh, my daughter worked out at Glacier National Park, and they have the bear spray out there. You can buy the bear spray. It goes from here to that. I mean, it's powerful. Buy the, buy the pepper spray. Any cat that gets up close to you, you spray it in the face. I promise you it won't stay. But if you've got your dog on a leash, and, you know, is this thing going to come start ground at you, or is it going to run away when it sees it? Because your depends. dog is on the leash. If, if it has become accustomed to not being afraid of you, if y'all have let them get that far, it could very easily come up to you and growl at your dog. But be way before it gets there, you ought to be aware. If you see a coyote out there 50 yards away and it starts walking toward you, there's something wrong. So you need to be start being defensive right then. I mean, in, in, in the country, if a vehicle pulls up, they run the other direction, much less a man steps out. <laughs> But you have to instill that fear back in these animals. Just one more question about our pets at night. We found in our neighborhood that cats that stay out all night don't do so well. No, sir. Uh, but what about leaving a big dog out like a lab? Is that a risk for that dog? Or? No, sir. Not, not very much at all. They're going to be pretty selective about what they take, and, and cats are ice cream. Like, how big of an animal do they usually eat? I mean, they're, they're females are 20. How big are the cats that they're eating? The dog. They're, they're, they're <laughs> characterize the, the, you know, opossums, cats. They eat calves. Calves. Yeah, it's bigger than them. They eat fawns. Those are a lot bigger than cats. Yes, ma'am. Keep brush cleared out of your yard and all that. That's, away. that. that's a very important thing, and it goes back to what this gentleman said about the dens. You do not want coyotes denning in your area because that is where the problems are going to occur. When they start rearing those pups, they become very protective of that area. They, any canine that's in that area, they consider it a threat, plus they have to be killing things to bring back to feed their pups. So a den is a bad thing to have in your neighborhood. When does it end? Well, they, the gestation period is 63 days after they, after they breed. They're breeding right now, so they're going to be denning, and they may have up to seven or eight different dens. So they'll move the pups from one den to the next, depending on whether they feel threatened or not. And after tonight, I hope they feel real threatened in this area. I mean, I hope you guys go out and really let them know. And they're, they're not intelligent, but they are very savvy about getting hurt, and they understand that. I got a question. Um, if you see a coyote, okay, and you're walking down the street, and you have this crazy dog that's barking at it, now, will the coyote bark? Do they make a noise? Do they growl? I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't find a rock. I've got this dumb dog on a, you know, barking. My, I'm not dumb dog, but barking. How would a coyote, I mean, a dog would, if they knew I was afraid, they'd come after me, right? I mean, why isn't a coyote like a dog? And that thinking, you know, they say, if you walk past a dog, they know you're afraid. How does, does a coyote know that the, I'd be afraid? The coyote does not know that you're going to be afraid and fears no fear from you unless you all have instilled that oh. in that coyote. You have to start doing the fear installation before you can start being really aggressive. But hopefully after tonight, you're not going to be walking your dog on a leash without pepper spray or a stick. <laughs> I'm not. I'm okay. just on the spray. Hornet spray is great. It is. You're great. Feet, feet. You're great. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Just about anything with starboard. Uh, uh, the, the, the boating uh, whistles, you know, the air horns, they're great. Anything loud. A paintball gun. Paintball gun. <laughs> now, now we're getting somewhere. Because when they start running around, you say, okay, that one's got three orange dots on it. He was over on half an hour. I like that. I may, I may go for that. <laughs> Cattle prod, great idea. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I want to uh, get some more information. I'm trying to get around it. I, so I understand the problem with extermination is this density and the increase in the size of the litters. And so that they will out, 
grow you more than you can exterminate them. Is that, that's as long as they want to stay here, that's correct. Now, how precise? Is it a linear relationship? What's the degree of density that's related to the degree of spawning? Because uh, it seems to me that in an urban area, in our area, on Hampton Avenue, where we live, and where we've seen coyotes in the middle of the street and in our backyard where we have a five-foot fence, uh, every coyote is a problem as far as I'm concerned. When you talk about problem coyotes, it seems to me every problem, every coyote that shows up on Hampton Avenue, in my opinion, is a problem coyote. And I think our government should treat it as a, as a problem. Now, it may be that they may be spawning somewhere else and so forth, and that may be an issue. But it seems to me that it's a defeatist attitude to not say that every coyote on Hampton Avenue is a problem coyote. Okay, let's assume that every coyote on Hampton Avenue is a problem. Now what are we going to do about it? Well, we'll call you and hopefully you will get rid of that coyote. That's the mistake that every other city in the United States has made. It will not work. Well, if you look at the totality of the city, that may be right. But for Hampton Avenue, it will work. We have to deal with the totality of the city and the totality of the state. And we have wildlife officers that work in an area that have maybe 170 square miles that they have to deal with. And we do not have the personnel, and wouldn't if we did, sorry to be so direct with you, to handle coyote control problems in downtown Nashville. We don't have the personnel. And it wouldn't do any good if we did. Well, what can the neighborhood do to add the resources so that our neighborhood is not infested with the coyotes? If other neighborhoods want to deal with it, that's fine. Push them into Williams and Wilson and grab them. Just away from us. <laughs> now, I also want to push back on the science. Because it just seems to me that it's not it's too uh, the extrapolation from rural to urban is not a clear situation. It seems to me that the, that the inbred genetics uh, that may apply in a rural area uh, are untested in, a, in, a, in an urban area. And so it just seems to me that it, that's too neat a solution. Now, I, I would like to push back on you a little bit and suggest that if it's a resource issue, this community is not without resources. And I think I'm certainly willing to write a check to help take care of the coyotes on Hampton, and I'm sure the people in the other areas are willing to do the same. So, I mean, if it's a resource question, I think we can deal with that locally. But I think that that's the question. What can we do within the law so that we are not going to run afoul of it? I'm not willing to break the law, but I'm willing to use the law and live within the law and get some help. If the resources are not available in your office, what can we do as citizens in the neighborhood to raise the resources to get, rid, to get rid of every coyote that's what I consider a problem in our area. I, I know, sir, that you don't believe me. That's obvious. But <laughs> if I had $50 million tomorrow to devote to this problem, the coyotes would win. The only way it will work is if y'all make coyotes afraid to come on Hampton Avenue. And they will move. As a matter of fact, the neighborhood that I went to two years ago may have moved from there into Hampton Avenue. <laughs> Do, do barking dogs bother them? Does that make them afraid? It's an attraction. It's an attraction. Unless it's the size of a dog of a German Shepherd or a larger. If you have a small dog that barks... No, I'm talking about a 35 pound dog. No, that's, that's, that's not an attraction. I thought you were talking about small dogs. No, it wouldn't be one way or the other. If they're not afraid of the dogs, but if you have a Great Pyrenees or a German Shepherd or one of the, one of the larger dogs, it is a deterrent. Um, right now, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Mayor Carl Dean, who uh, uh, certainly has a vested interest in this problem, not only from a public safety standpoint, but also because he's uh, a nearby resident. So um, please help me welcome Mayor Carl Dean. I, I think this is stuffed, I think. We're, we're not quite sure yet. Uh, well, I'm, I guess I'm glad to be here. Um, <laughs> let me thank the church for, for allowing us to be here, and thank you all for coming. I, you know, this, what I tell people is, if, of all the issues that uh, I get to work on every day, and, and it's a privilege to, to do what I do, uh, the issue I hear about from my neighbors more than any other is this one. Um, and I don't have the answers, um, and that's why we have uh, district council members. <laughs> <laughs> And we are blessed to have, uh, and I say this very sincerely, uh, you know, Carter Todd is here from the Oak Hill area. 
uh, and Sean, who is, our, who is our council member, we have two who are extremely conscientious, who work very hard and, and take all this very seriously. Um, and I, I feel that, um, you know, when, when I call and when I talk to them and I tell them about my concerns about coyotes, they listen and they work with us. And I'd also like to thank our Department of Health. Um, you know, one of the advantages I guess I have is I meet with the Department of Health periodically about a variety of issues, and it's generally not coyotes. But when uh, Dr. Paul uh, comes into my office or when Brent comes in, I do mention that um, I have a little neighborhood issue, and it's coyotes. <laughs> so people are, are hearing about it. And, they, and, and I know Dr. Paul, who's here, talks to the state and, and, and conveys that message. Um, you know, for me, it is just a brief story about coyotes for, from my perspective, because I've, I've seen them on the street and they've never bothered me. They've, you know, the only time that uh, I've seen one that seemed a little more confident than others in terms of not immediately running when, uh, when my car drove by or I walked by, but I've never had a bad incident other than the fact that we lost a cat. And, you know, we had a cat for my middle child, my, my daughter, who uh, is now a freshman in high school. We got for her when she was five, and the cat disappeared this summer. And as a former public defender, I can't prove that a coyote did it, but I've got some pretty, pretty strong suspicions. Um, and it's, it's an issue. I mean, obviously, if you have pets that you love, and, 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 and my, my wife is a huge dog lover, and, uh, and, my, and my, I have my, my kids who love their animals, and I'm kind of fond of them too, it's a concern. Uh, but I would encourage you to listen to what the folks here tonight said and take advantage. If, there is a, if you see a coyote on our street that is, a, 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 what's the word, a troublesome coyote or a, a problem coyote, call the state. Just do that uh, and, and, and see what, what can be done. Uh, that's probably the best advice uh, you're, you're going to get, and I think, it, I, think it's, I think it's good advice. Uh, and I'm not going to forget about it. I mean, you know, every day I get up and I think I'm going to the office to work on the, on the budget, which is really tough this year, or I'm going to the ho office to work on General Hospital, or I'm going to the office to, uh, to work on whatever. And I usually have uh, Ann will say to me, what about the coyotes, Carl? Uh, so it, 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 believe me, I do not, I do not forget. And, uh, and, I, and, and if Ann doesn't say it, Francis, my, my middle child, will. Uh, so, so, so please, um, so please, Call the health department, call the state, they want to help, and, and, and we'll do the very, very best that we, we can.